Hello everybody, I'm Kevin, your teacher, and today we're going to be working with the text uh, the, Path the Plastic Pink Flamingo, A Natural History uh, by Jennifer Price. This is a sample AP language and composition rhetorical analysis prompt um, from the year 2006, um, and it is available online. So I'm going to attempt to get this done here in 40 minutes. I've got uh, 39 minutes and, and 59 seconds on the clock. Um, so with that, I'll try to simulate as close as it can be um, to the kind of thinking process and writing process of working through the rhetorical analysis. Here we go. Oh, that, there we go. All right. The passage below is an excerpt from Jennifer Price's recent essay, The Plastic Pink Flamingo, A Natural History. We want to pay attention to uh, titles and things like that when we're going through. Um, plastic pink flamingo, a natural history. Why is that not working? Come on. There we go. All right. So, want to highlight that word natural there. Um, the essay examines the popularity of the plastic pink flamingo in the 1950s. Okay, so we get some context. Read the passage carefully, then write an essay in which you analyze how Price crafts the text to reveal her view of U.S. culture. Cool. So now we've got a pretty good idea of what we want to do for uh, the prompt here in order to answer it. We're going to need two things. One, um, we're going to need to know what is her view on United States culture? How is she characterizing it? And two, uh, talk about specific moves that she's making as a writer, um, different things that she's doing to try to reach that. So I'm going to talk less and read more. All right, so let's go through and kind of look for that. So we want to keep an eye out, um, notice things that are revealing her view about the U.S. Uh, and noticing little things she's doing with her craft here as a writer too that uh, might give us some insight into her argument. So when the pink flamingo splashed into the 50s market, right away splashed, uh, it's interesting, it staked two major claims to boldness. First, it was a flamingo. Since the 1930s, vacationing Americans had been flocking ha, 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 to Florida and returning home with flamingo souvenirs. In the 1910s and 20s, Miami Beach's first grand hotel, the Flamingo, had made the bird synonymous with wealth and pizzazz. That's another good word. Uh, later, developers built hundreds of more modest hotels to cater to an eager middle class served by new train lines, and in South Beach especially, Architects employed the playful Art Deco style, replete with bright pinks and flamingo motifs. This was a little ironic since Americans had hunted flamingos to extinction in Florida in the late 1800s for their plumes and meat. So we've got a lot of dates so far right off the bat, so we want to notice that we're getting uh, a history that's here. Uh, but no matter, uh, so that's a kind of ironic sort of change in tone there. Um, Americans had hunted flamingos to extinction in Florida in the late 1800s for plumes and meat, but no matter. In the 1950s, the new interstates would draw working class tourists down too. So we have here new interstates um, versus before it was new train lines, something that I noticed there. Uh, would draw working class tourists down too. Back in New Jersey, the Union Products Flamingo inscribed one's lawns emphatically with Florida's cachet of leisure and extravagance. Uh, it's a great sentence. So it uh, is personified here, the flamingo, and it inscribes one's lawn emphatically uh, with Florida's cachet of leisure and extravagance. Uh, similar to pizzazz and splash early on, we get this very uh, extravagant language that's there to kind of reveal what's going on here. Um, the bird acquired an extra fillip of boldness, too, from the direction of Las Vegas, the flamboyant oasis of instant riches that the gangster, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, had conjured from the desert in 1946 with his Flamingo Hotel. So again, more dates here. Uh, anyone who has seen Las Vegas knows that a flamingo stands out in a desert even more strikingly than on a lawn. Huh. In the 1950s, Namesake flamingo motels, restaurants, and lounges cropped up across the country like a, like a line of semiotic sprouts. Uh, great 
sentence there. Just even listen to that rhythm of the S's that's going on there. It's why I messed it up the first time that I read it. Uh, in the 1950s, namesake flamingo motels, restaurants, and lounges cropped up across the country like a line of semiotic sprouts. Uh, lots of k sounds, lots of s sounds that are going into that sentence. Uh, and the flamingo was pink, a second and commensurate claim to boldness. Um, so we're connecting now, we're getting uh, a link back to this first um, kind of thing that she brings up in the beginning to set out her argument that it's got two major claims to boldness, the pink flamingo. The first uh, one, it's a flamingo. Duh. Two, it's pink. Okay, so let's uh, <laughs> see what else makes it bold. Uh, and the flamingo was pink, a second and commensurate claim to boldness. The plastics industries of the late 50s favored flashy colors, which Tom Wolfe called the new electrochemical pastels of the Florida littoral. Tangerine, broiling magenta, livid pink, incarnadine, fuchsia d'amour, congo ruby, methyl green. That is a difficult sentence to read. Um, so the plastic industries of the 50s. So again, you get another year here. We're up to the present sort of when uh, Price is talking about this. Favored, 50s favored flashy colors. Uh, this letter F is coming up all the time as we're reading. Uh, the sounds of the language here uh, seem really important to Price as she's writing. Um, favored flashy colors, which Tom Wolfe, um, so Tom Wolfe is a fairly well-known nonfiction, literary nonfiction author um, who wrote a bunch of stuff. His heyday was sort of in the 60s and 70s, um, but sort of a well-known literary figure to be invoking here, um, called these colors the, uh, the new electrochemical pastels of the Florida littoral. Tangerine, broiling magenta, livid pink, incarnadine, fuchsia doomer, congo ruby, methyl green. Uh, again, I messed it up because it's hard to read these words. Um, they're almost words that aren't meant to be spoken. Uh, in fact, that word, the Florida, I don't know how to say that word, literal, uh, littoral. Uh, I Googled it the other day when I first chose this, and it means coastline, um, and I don't know why. I haven't looked more into it. Um, but we get all of these really um, electrochemical, artificial sounding words here um, associated with uh, nature, so describing nature in unnatural terms. And when I see that, I think back to the original title of uh, the book that this is from, uh, The Plastic Pink Flamingo, A Natural History. So it's plastic, but the book itself is called A Natural History. So we want to notice that tension here. Um, the hues were forward-looking rather than old-fashioned. So these colors were forward-looking rather than old-fashioned, moving forward. Um, just right for a generation raised in the depression that was ready to celebrate its new affluence. And as Carol Ann Marling has written, the sassy pinks were the hottest color of the decade. Washing machines, cars, and kitchen counters proliferated in passion pink, sunset pink, and Bermuda pink. In 1956, right after he signed his first recording contract, Elvis Presley bought a pink Cadillac. So again, uh, the sound of those letters going in there, all of the letter P's, we get years again. Um, also, this is the first time I'm noticing that uh, Price is using other people's names. Here in this paragraph, she's invoking the author Tom Wolfe, uh, Carol Ann Marling, and then Elvis Presley, of course, at the end, um, to maybe put a little bit of credibility in there. I mean, I She's pretty credible already. She seems to know her stuff with the history in the beginning, um, but an interesting kind of uh, shift that she makes there. The other thing that I'm noticing is that um, these are sort of the washing machines, cars, and kitchen counters proliferated in passion pink. Um, these are all sort of symbols of middle-class America in many ways, um, you know, marking the modern conveniences that um, many people after the Depression, after World War II, um, were able to, to find when the car kind of opened up this suburban world for people. Um, okay, so we get those references there. Why, after all, call the birds pink flamingos as if they could be blue or green? Hmm, 
interesting question. So uh, after all this build up here, she uh, uses this rhetorical question here to make us pause. Uh, and looking at that again, it's a, a little, it's a little clunky, but I think that's the, it's, it's on purpose, this idea like, we had all of these different colors here. Um, why, after all, call the birds pink flamingos? Or pink flamingos, really, is what she's saying. Uh, why call them pink flamingos? Could they be blue or green? Why do we need to, to have the word pink in there? Obviously, flamingos are pink. That's what they are uh, in the real life. So why do we need to describe it? So she says, then, the plastic flamingo is a hotter pink than a real flamingo, and even a real flamingo is brighter than anything else around it. I love that sentence. Um, so a plastic flamingo is bright and it stands out, and even the real flamingo is bright and it stands out. So we have this thing that's a copy of it, um, but it is even more intense in some ways uh, than, than the real pink flamingo is. Uh, there are five species. So we're talking about real flamingos now. There's not five species of uh, plastic ones. They're all just plastic. So um, even a real flamingo is brighter than anything else around it. There are five species, all of which feed in flocks on algae and invertebrates in saline and alkaline lakes and mostly warm habitats around the world. The people who have lived near these places have always singled out the flamingo as special. So real, f real flamingos now, we switch from all the artificial ones into the real ones at the end here. Um, people who've lived near them have always thought they were special, special. So early Christians associated it with the red phoenix. In ancient Egypt, it symbolized the sun god Ra. In Mexico and the Caribbean, it remains a major motif in art, dance, and literature. No wonder that the subtropical species stood out so loudly when Americans in temperate New England reproduced it, brightened it, and sent it wading across an inland sea of grass. <laughs> so no wonder then. So we get kind of an answer uh, to this rhetorical question that she asks at the beginning of the paragraph. Uh, it's no wonder that the subtropical, uh, subtropical species stood out so loudly when Americans in temperate New England reproduced it, brightened it, and sent it wading across an inland sea of grass. Uh, so another sort of tension there, an inland sea uh, made out of grass, so something that's not really a sea after all. Um, so. Yeah, so time management wise, I, I stopped and I talked to y'all for a little bit. Um, we're a little bit less than 10 minutes to kind of work our way through it. Um, so now that I've, I've read through it and I've sort of noticed things, I'm looking at my marks here on, on the page and I wanna start thinking about um, what, what I wanna say about this. Uh, so I'm gonna open up a new window here. And I forgot to add it, which was silly, but it's just eating away at my time. All right, so window, I'm going to bring up a document that I have here. There we go. Okay. So I'm just going to chop that down. I've got, a, I've got a window open where I'm going to start to try writing uh, a little bit, and we'll see how this works out with my, my text here. But um, Okay, so I want to be figuring out here um, what I want to say. So uh, when I look at that prompt, I ask myself um, if I'm rewriting this question in my own words, I'm wondering um, how, how does Price uh, view the culture of the United States? And then the second thing that I'm looking to answer is um, how do her choices as a writer help make this point? So not super, not super pretty, but those are two questions that I'm kind of thinking about here as I dive back in. So, all right. Uh, some things now when I think about what we talked about, the, uh, the sounds of these words come up a lot. So sounds of words. Um, I'm thinking about the Fs, the uh, Cos, um, the 
classes. So we've got sounds of words, um, the historical um, lesson, you know, and chronological uh, order. So her essay is laid out in chronological order in many ways, um, except sort of at the end when she connects it to ancient peoples um, where she sort of takes a step back out, which uh, we may want to think about that as well. Um, so I notice the sound of words, uh, the historical lesson, the chronological order. And the other thing that I, I notice is the, the tone here. Um, I don't quite know how to characterize it yet. Um, I'm thinking in particular about um, the but, but no matter that happens uh, towards the uh, beginning of the second paragraph. Also, um, where else stood out there? You know, even that, that sentence um, of the last paragraph, why after all call them uh, as, if, as if they could be blue or green? Um, so interesting sort of things there. So those are some of the choices that I notice. Um, you know, the word sounds and it, the references I think will, um, will work here and then talking about tone. Um, the other thing that she stakes out early on, in addition to it being sort of historical uh, and laid out in chronological order, she comes right out at the beginning and says that it's, there's this idea of boldness um, and that her, her thesis itself is that the pink flamingo above all else is bold. Um, and how does she prove that? Well, two ways. Uh, one, it's a flamingo. Uh, and two, it's pink. Interestingly, uh, there is a third thing in that title. It's plastic, um, but she doesn't bring that up here. Instead, maybe that's something that we're supposed to, to think about, that like the plastic part of it doesn't make it bold. Instead, it's the fact that it's a flamingo and it's the fact that it's pink. Um, but it's interesting that plastic pink flamingo is the title, um, but she only talks about two of the words that show up in that title. So we want to kind of get keyed in on that. Um, so boldness, flamingo, and pink. Um, and yeah, she goes on to sort of, I'm going to put this back up here in brackets just to remind myself that she doesn't actually think that. <laughs> um, and then thinking about that argument too, it, it isn't just like the flamingo... Uh, itself that she's talking about at first. Um, she doesn't talk about the real flamingo until the, the final paragraph. Uh, instead, she's talking about flamingos as this type of symbol. Um, she goes on to even say in line uh, 29, 28, 29, um, she uses the word semiotic, um, semiotic sprouts. Uh, and this is a word that you're may not be too familiar with, um, but semiotics is sort of the study of signs and symbols. Um, so it comes from the same word as, as symbol, I believe. Uh, so she's explicitly putting out there that she's not talking about real flamingos. She's talking about this flamingo as a symbol. Uh, and what is she saying that it symbolizes? Well, um, she comes right out and says that it is... Um, Florida's cachet, uh, Florida's cachet of leisure and extravagance. Um, I always spell that word, it's extravagance. Oh, no, should have listened to Google. Um, so we, now it's on, oh well. Uh, so we get the symbol, uh, it stands for tropical, exotic, uh, rich, wealthy, um, you know, uh, going on to, to talk about some of these locations like Miami Beach, South Beach, the Art Deco style, um, this idea of Florida sort of um, standing for this, this pizzazz, as she puts it. Um, so again, we're not necessarily talking about Florida as a place, um, as a state, um, but instead Florida as a symbol of the tropics and vacation and leisure, sort of kicking back and relaxing, living that Florida lifestyle. Um, and then the second thing that she's talking about here um, with the color pink 
is also uh, she does something really smart where she, you know she thinks about pink as a symbol as well, um, just like f the flamingo is a symbol for Florida, which itself is a symbol for leisure and success in you know mid-century America here after World War II. Um, also, the color pink is a symbol itself. Um, interestingly, she doesn't really go into um, the gender associations that go with pink sort of as a color. Um, it was earlier in American history that uh, it turned out that um, the colors shifted at one point even. It used to be that uh, pink was a more masculine color and a blue was associated with more feminine colors in young children. Um, but then it switched uh, at some point in the 19, I forget exactly when, with the Sears catalog is the story that I've always heard. Uh, but I digress. Um, she talks about pink as this symbol um, for, for success, uh, for those markers of being a successful middle class person um, that, you know, gets a pink Cadillac, gets the pink washing machine. It was kind of the trendy uh, color of, of that time. Came back again even in the, the last 10 years. I remember people talking about millennial pink um, being sort of like a bubblegum uh, pinky color that was popular with folks of a certain age. Um, but in either case, we get this idea of pink as a symbol. Um, we get this idea of the colors themselves being bright, um, neon almost, and um, something that really stands out. Um, finally, she sort of pivots here at the end, like we, we talked about, um, bringing them up again. Why would we call them pink flamingos? Well, because pink flamingos, I don't know the... Uh, <laughs> The sign for does not equal, I always forget that, um, the shortcut, does not equal real flamingos. So she's drawing a line here um, between pink flamingos and real ones. Uh, yeah, real ones are pink and they stand out, but they're not pink pink. They're not that electrochemical pastel with all of those other weird colors that are in there. Um, good. I haven't looked at my time, and I've had a lot of digressions. Where are we at? 18 minutes. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see. So now I've got a pretty good idea of what, what I want to be saying um, as far as evidence and what I want to sort of point out, but I don't really have a thesis yet. Um, and again, you know, that's going to be the first trick here, and we're coming up on about 15 minutes, so I want to get a thesis down for sure. Um, and what I see when I'm reading this, a word um, that stands out to me is this idea of something being artificial. Um, the, the flamingos themselves are, are fake. Uh, the colors are fake. Uh, and when I think about that with the different points of, of history, I almost think that, you know, she talks about the 1930s and the Great Depression, people coming out of that. She talks about new development with like new train lines, um, then talks about the next big thing of um, the, the interstate highway system. And then that leads to uh, the suburbs and that leads to people um, moving out and filling their large homes with these, these pink things that, that mark success. Um, yet, I see these things in here too about like uh, ab about sort of the the impact on um, you know not necessarily yes yeah, sort of on the environment. Uh, she doesn't come right out and say it, um, but thinking about the the hunting of flamingos uh, almost to extinction um, throughout history and in the fact that it's ironic that it becomes a um, comes back so. It seems to me that she has a uh, not entirely positive view of American culture, you know. Um, lots of the stuff here seems ironic. Um, so I'm going to say for now, because I want to get going on writing this thing, that um, Price, what's the word I want to? I'm going to use reveals for now, but maybe I'll come back. Price re reveals a cynical attitude towards the United 
to the culture of the United States. And it's um, Price of Real is a cynical attitude towards the culture of the U.S. Uh, and it's reliance on material wealth and objects to show off their status in society. It's okay. We'll take that for now. Um, she, through careful attention to the sounds of words, um, active and, I don't want to say active, I want to say um, flamboyant. She uses that too. Uh, flamboyant uh, diction. Sound of words, flamboyant diction, and I actually am going to cut out this sound of words thing. It's not good enough to be in the thesis. Flamboyant diction, um, through careful attention to flamboyant diction, um, historical, I'll put that later. An analysis of cultural icons as symbols. Careful analysis, diction, and in the analysis of cultural icons as symbols. Price traces the history of the plastic pink flamingo throughout. This is the history of the plastic pink flamingo to convey a cynicism towards American tendency to use wealth, well, tendency towards showing off there, towards American tendency to show off s social status through material wealth. Okay. So now I can cut that. And I've got a thesis. Uh, it's not great, but it's there. And I've got, uh-oh, I don't know if that's been running down. I've got 12 minutes. Okay. So uh, first, I want to talk about flamboyant diction. Um, price. Price's tone throughout the piece is it excited and in her own words bold um, price utilizes alliteration of letters such as p utilizes alliteration in sentences like um, Flocking to Florida, and where was that other one that I, semiotic sprouts, and I forget where else that was now, that's all right, I got two, and semiotic sprouts. This, coupled with her decision to use uh, ev to use vivid language that evokes 
coupled with her decision to use vivid language to evoke the excited, I'm just writing the excited splendor of 1950s America, such as splashed pizzazz. And here's another one. Let's just leave that though. Splashed and pizzazz. Build towards her argument of the plastic. Of let's just talk real flamingo of the symbolic flamingo representing a almost gaudy desire to show off for others. Her prices choice of referencing gangster Bugsy's Flamingo Hotel is one of several um, suggestions made throughout the piece that this I'm getting worried about my time, that's right. Uh, several suggestions made throughout the piece that this reliance on material possessions has a negative impact on others. So Bugsy uh, I want to make that more explicit. Um, have a negative. We can only imagine that this that these instant riches come with a cost. Las Vegas was not built or founded, instead conjured up as if by magic in the desert. Um, good, I like that. Now I want to talk about the another um, we see this again to a similar uh, effect uh, with the effect. I did it wrong. I always do that. Bad English teacher. Uh, in her um, inclusion of the to a similar effect when she includes in her <laughs> she includes historical fact concerning the near extinction of real <laughs> I didn't need to underline that didn't mean to real flamingos uh, in Florida the real one not the symbolic Florida so I think that that's not enough to be a new paragraph. So I'm going to get this all on one page here. All right. So what else now? Six minutes, tone, Florida. However, now I can pivot to tone. Uh, price sk skillfully, however, after this, 
after this gruesome detail, Price skillfully employs an understated irony with the remark, but no matter, but no matter. Indeed, there was no matter, despite the uh, despite the the growing American middle class the progress and innovations of the mid 20th century had negative had had other negative effects a little repetitive but that's okay we now know that the new train lines that sprung across the country have been largely abandoned. And the cars that came to replace them drive upon those same drive upon the new, what does she say, new interstates of the 1950s. We also know, know now that those interstates had profoundly detrimental impacts on many neighborhoods, mostly in lower income areas and impacted a disproportionately high number of people of color. Uh, however, after this gruesome, blah, 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 uh, so we see a dark side. Um, prices. I talked about yet. Uh, artificial, bold, plastic, pink. <laughs> In fact, much of the wealth generated during this time has. seems artificial. Mm. Uh, how do I want to wrap this up? Price's invocation of Wolf in his description of fake. E electrochemical hues um, suggests, thanks Google, sorry, that's cheating, suggests that, uh, what was I going to say? Price's invocation of Wolf in his description of fake mm, suggests that Americans for the most part, do not care if something that Americans of the 1950s, for the most part, did not care if something was real or artificial. Instead, the focus was on how can I stand out the most among my neighbors. 
although we think of the suburban 1950s as one of conformity and pretty pink homes, a strong independent, a strong independence still permeated society in a country which values rugged individualism, sometimes to a fault. The pink plastic flamingo stands as a powerful symbol for the damage these attitudes can cause. Period. <laughs> All right. It's not great. Uh, but it's but it's there. So I'm just going through and I would have to submit this now. Uh, luckily on the actual test you can um, you can kind of pick, you get just a two hour block to do all three essays. So if you would move along after this 40 minutes and would want to come back to it, um, you could take another look at it. So um, I am going to pretend that my, my time is officially up and I couldn't just ramble on or, or keep going again for the sake of the argument. Um, I'll move this up just so that folks can take a look at this document. If you would like to read it closer, I'll also put my annotated copy of the, the notes online um, so that you can see that if you will. I'm not going to get that heading in there so it stays on one page. Um, and yeah, just out of curiosity, let's see what my word count is. Whoops. Word count. Twenty-four, or I'm sorry, 389 words. So, uh, do you have a thesis statement in there? Again, you know, that's not the best essay, um, but it, it's in there. And I think that um, you know, my use of of evidence um, could have been stronger. Um, you know, I suppose let's just take a look real quick at what um, the rubric says here. Um, so I'm going to pop this over. Oops, made my little. All right, so thesis, it uh, responds to the prompt with a defensible thesis that analyzes the rhetorical choices. Um, yeah, I think I would get that point. I'm comfortable with that. Um, here, I do make textual re references, I think, that are, are relevant to, to my thesis. Um, and do try to explain. I think that, you know, I'm not to a four, but I, I think that this, this would be three-ish, um, you know, maybe I would fall a little bit short of getting that third point. Um, I do think, though, that um, I would get the sophistication point. I think that it's a sophisticated reading here to bring in um, some of these other details about um, the rhetorical situation, you know, talking about the cultural context in America as it develops over time, which makes sense here too because her, uh, her argument I is structured that way as sort of a historical chronological reading. So um, in either case, hopefully that think aloud process uh, has helped a little bit. Again, your mileage may vary, um, but sometimes it's just useful to hear another person's take on a piece of writing. So um, hope you enjoyed the video and uh, yeah, enjoy your writing, thanks.